So I'm going to move a little bit more on metastatic breast cancer now. And, you know, it, it is a, you know, the good news is going to increase because the number is more women are alive. But, you know, the, the bad news is that, you know, I, I'm not so sure that we are equipped to handle with the level of sophistication and attention that is required the problem of metastatic breast cancer in this country, so and maybe in the world. But I just want to say that I don't see, you know, I have a lot of hope in genomics and the revolution in new biological agents and combination of treatment and so on, but I don't see the problem of metastatic breast cancer disappearing in the next five years. And I think there, too, we need a lot of advocacy, a lot of support, of course, from the doctor's point of view, but also from families and from survivors to make it clear that it is a central issue in breast cancer. Because when I sit in study sections and they are looking again for a new gene, a new discovery, a new signal transduction, and as soon as there is a clinical protocol, they kill it because it's just clinical. I feel like screaming because it may not be the perfect or the best protocol, but what we need are treatments now, not in 50 years. You know, this is a public health emergency, and you know, at a certain point, some of these women are confronted not only with the fact that they have to live with the recurrence, the persistence, what I said, the issue of do I still trust my doctors, do I still go back to the same institution, but also with the daily reality that there are not enough options. We should have a lot of resources for the people sick today. Of course we want to prevent the disease, of course we want to take care of the patients early on, but the reality is the ones who are sick now. And uh, uh, trust me, we as doctors have to take the responsibility for having failed. You know, we have not been able to solve the problem. Otherwise, we never have the women coming back with the disease, right? So somehow, the, the fact that it's so nice to talk about prevention and so much effort on prevention is really not fair. We, there is a public health emergency has to be addressed. And I would say across all metastatic cancers. But in breast cancer, we have the fortune that women with metastatic breast cancer now are often in good shape, are strong, are our partners in, ma in making sure we're heard. So need help on that. So I have to say that I have, I have and I've had dear friends with metastatic breast cancer, I had the chance to be next to them and, and see what their life is. And it's difficult to start with and then there is this sense of urgency that the options are not always there. And, you know, I think Lilia pointed out very clearly that maybe this, there is a perfect trial, but you're not matching the trial, or, you know, you may be perfect for the trial that is not ready yet to be open, or, they, you know, somehow you lost the window of opportunity to match with the trial. So this stress has to go away. This is not the way to practice medicine. So. It has to be that we tailor the trials around the patient, not that the patient has to figure out the correct window to this magic match with the trial. So not enough trials, not enough original ideas, not enough ease in having access to non-FDA approved, maybe there is a drug is approved for another malignancy. Why on earth shouldn't it go across? I understand we need the prospective randomized trial and all that evidence, but if it, the tumor of the patient has the markers for that drug, why denying it? And we have lessons, you know, in the AIDS community, they figure out ways to get around the rules and to somehow push. Why not? Why not breast cancer? And I have to say, I know it sounds absurd, but breast cancer is actually one of those fields where advocacy really has made a difference. So if we cannot pull it through with breast cancer, I, I don't even want to mention about the other solid tumors. So more clinical trials, with all respect, and people that know me well, in, uh, my colleagues know that I, I really mean it. There shouldn't be NCI cancer centers without a lot of clinical trials. Now, I, don't, I completely agree we cannot force our patients to get into clinical trials, but we can force doctors to have a lot of clinical trials open. So the choice, it goes back to the patient, but the options have to be many more than what we have now. So, Needless to say, these women are my heroes, and, and you are. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I, when I, 
eventually settled a little bit more at, at NYU. The first, I actually had another trial, which was I have for local advanced breast cancer and one for prostate and one for cervical cancer. But it, so diseases that are not that, that early. But the disease that really interested me the most was probably metastatic breast cancer. And I, we, we tried to test, and I'll move a little fast because I see that Deborah is getting nervous about my length, which I'm famous for stretching my lectures. Um, I, I tried to converse some work we were doing in collaboration with some basic scientists here in, in NYU in which we realized we could use maybe radiation to, as a tool to leverage the immune system in cancer. And I'm going to talk about a, a, a trial that originally was open for metastatic breast cancer, and then because we saw some success, we opened for more uh, metastatic disease. And the idea in, in general of what we're trying to do is that this is a tumor, it's a tumor cell with, her, with its antigens and, you know, uh, markers on, on the surface and within the contents of the cells. And there are these cells called dendritic cells that, that like, patrol the tumor microenvironment in the tumor, and they're walking around. And they're not really capable to function the way they should be functioning because for whatever reason, the tumor has created a microenvironment, something that uh, Deborah alluded to, that blinds them, that makes them think the tumor is self. So the way we maintain, you know, our skin, our, you know, our organs, our, um, you know, the integrity of the way we somehow uh, survive is that the immune system has learned not to reject what is considered self, what is considered normal. So what we learn about tumor immunity or lack of rejection of tumors is that somehow these cells and other cells are capable to read the tumor, but they consider it non-dangerous. So somehow the, the immune system is paralyzed. So the best natural resource we have to reject diseases is out of the question, is gone, is history. And it is up to a certain degree. So there may be some recognition, but not strong enough to reject the tumor. So it's not really a completely uh, black and white kind of setting, but is bad enough to allow for the tumor to continue to grow. And then what's going on is that we, we felt that maybe if we use radiation to break the tumor down and break it down in a way, maybe in combination with chemotherapy, but in a way that is not silent to the immune system. So the immune system can recognize it as a danger signal. Something really bad is going on. Maybe we can revert this kind of blindness. And if we are successful, for instance, there will be new pieces of the tumor, new proteins that the immune system hasn't seen before that now get broken by funny ways that radiation can break tumor cells. Then now may trick the tumor system, the, 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 the immune system to look at the tumor as something dangerous, finally. So the idea is danger signals that come from radiation may awaken the immune system. And if we're lucky, then what happens is that the good cells, like the CD4 versus the CD8 cells, that are crucial in mounting an immune response, come, and sorry for the special effects, it's my postdoc in the, in the lab that loves this, like teenager, that so keeps killing the tumor because the immune system works, and eventually, if you're lucky enough, not only you, you kill the primary tumor, that is already a big um, achievement, but maybe now you give a memory that is capable to also go after the metastasis. So if we're successful at doing this, whenever from the niche where the metastatic cell is sitting there asleep and dormant, whenever the metastatic cell awakens, there is now a memory. So now it's rejected the way we reject if we were exposed to tuberculosis when we were young or whatever, we reject if the tuberculosis, you know, bacillus, bacillus wakes up again, we have a system to recognize this bad, non-self, and kick it out, right? So wouldn't it be nice to have this in any cancer? Because when the you know, tumor cell wakes up again, the body says, no, 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 this is not self, this is bad, we want it out. So that would be the dream. Of course, there are millions of barriers, and we, we decided that we're going to test this hypothesis, and we did it, unfortunately, in a mouse. You know, I'm a chicken, really, literally, so I'm not that good at working with animals, but somebody in the lab helped, helped me doing it, uh, Dr. Sandra De Maria, who's an immunologist here. And what we decided was that we could mimic in a mouse, and I'm going to show you the model in a minute, this idea. So this is the primary, we, we made, use a mouse under anesthesia and so on, and we put two nodules, one on one side, one on the other. 
And if our hypothesis was correct, if we were to give radiation to this one, and at the same time maybe help the immune system a little bit, and I'll tell you in a minute what we did, maybe not only we will see this one respond to radiation, but the nodule that did not get radiation, maybe it will get smaller if we were successful. That's, we're trying to reproduce in a mouse what we see in patients with metastasis or patients with multiple lesions. So we decided that what we were going to use to help the immune system was a growth factor, which is very similar to GMCSF. So you guys probably get GSCSF or have heard about GSCSF, which is something called uh, Neulasta that helps in the, the bone marrow make white blood cells. Well, this is a growth factor for mice that makes more white blood cells, including lymphocytes. So we said, all right, we're going to amplify those dendritic cells, those funny uh, star cells that I showed you before. We're going to get more of them, make them lively and strong and so on with this drug. And then we're going to see whether by killing this tumor, we're getting a response in the other one. So we try, put the radiation, and we set the response both here and there. And what we can show here, so now stay with me, this little biology, first grade or whatever, <laughs> basic biology, for first year, <laughs> first year, biology, <laughs> beginning of biology. So this is the mouse that didn't get anything. So the tumor, both this one, the black one here and there, they're growing both ways. So this is a mouse that got that, the growth factor just for the dendritic cells that I told you. And doesn't seem to do much, and we wouldn't expect, otherwise we would use it as a conventional treatment, but it didn't, so this is growing in both sides. Both sides are growing the same. And this is a mouse that got radiation in green to the primary tumor only, as we had planned, and you see that, of course, radiation kills the primary tumor, but no difference, ups, sorry, on the other tumor, because you're radiating one, you're not irradiating the other one. But when you combine this little help to the immune system with the radiation, not only you get an effect on the tumor you radiate, but you get the effect on the other one too. So this was the first proof of evidence in mice that by using radiation with a very basic and otherwise non-efficient, as you can see in red, immune modulation, you were able to, in fact, get an effect outside the radiation field. So said, all right, we love it. Now we want to try to see whether there is a safe way to do it in human beings. And we designed a pilot study that used and I'll tell you in a minute why chemotherapy as well um, was included, but we were trying to make this upscopal means effect outside the focus, so outside the target. So we wanted to see whether we could do that in human beings and with this proof of principle trial. So we wanted to irradiate one metastatic lesion and then give GMCSF, which is equivalent of what we did in mice before in patients with, who had metastatic solid tumors. And again, this is the concept. You give radiation here. The GMCSF makes these dendritic cells more activated and somehow recovers one obstacle the patients have of, in their immune system. If you're lucky, you have a better cross-presentation, which is a mechanism by which these dendritic cells that are like policemen cells recognize the tumor cells and say, okay, this is a bad cell. We have to reject it. If this is successful, then you have in the lymph node the, you know, the induction of an immune response and eventually this kind of effect through the immune system that will kill the tumor and the metastasis outside the radiation field. So this is the way it's given. And what happens then, we had four different MDs than me because, of course, I'm biased. and want to be right, so I would not be very objective. Review, review, two minutes, I'm gone. Uh, um, review our slides, and I'm showing you this is the patients we did. We have 25 patients. We really have... Um, most of them were lung cancer, but some breast cancer. And this is a response. So in 11 out of 23, we could see a response outside the field. So, you know, the, the effect was enormous. So if you start breaking a little bit the paradigms, maybe you can get an effect. So this is a case where we're treating the mediastinum in this patient. This is the radiation dose distribution. But we're really checking whether this completely out of the field lesion will go away, and true enough, it went away completely, and it's maintained a year later. So you see, you see at the beginning, fading away, gone forever, right? This is lung cancer to, with another metastasis in the lung. It's primary lung cancer with another metastasis in the lung. <clears throat> it's a metabolic, it's a patient with breast cancer with a metabolic, uh, sorry, with lung cancer again that had radiation to um, um, uh, the posterior lung, 
but not, you see here is like a, a lymph node in the abdomen is a, that is very active at PET scan. It goes down and gradually goes away with three months of follow-up. So is a response to a PET scan. So in conclusion, you can achieve this kind of results and, and you, you can have ways to irradiate one lesion in that response outside the field. And these, all these patients were kept on the same chemotherapy because the medical oncology was nervous to, uh, they were sick enough, the medical oncology was nervous to stop the chemotherapy, even if they had already progressed in that chemotherapy. So in a certain sense, we had a built-in disadvantage because the chemotherapy can also be immune suppressant. So, but we did it, and now we are on the verge of similar trial where we're doing without chemotherapy and see whether it could be um, just used as a mechanism to down-regulate um, other metastases in a very well-tolerated, almost no toxicity in this trial. So I think I'll stop here. Um, I just want to recognize that we desperately needed a way to measure the immune system in these patients, and we're lucky because you, you really, when you see an immune response, you really want to prove that it's immune-mediated, immune and we got the support by this group. is like a, you know, a, a coalition, the Manhasset group of a women coalition against breast cancer were very generous to fund the immune monitoring part of this of this trial. So I'll stop here and just want to say that all of this is possible because